All right, game time. All right, guys. Uh, I want to welcome everybody back to our uh, virtual training. Today we're going to start our um, – first of all, I want to thank everybody who's been joining us, everybody who joined last week for the uh, headlinesmen and, uh, and line judges. I think we had, they had a great presentation. Uh, the use of video was pretty good. Uh, I think everybody got a lot out of it. Uh, we're going to move on to our third section of our training this week. It's going to be the back judges, side judges, and field judges. Presenting today will be Brandon Spencer. He's in the Conference USA. Howard Terrier, he's been in our chapter for 35 years. Uh, Terrell Turner, he has been in the MEAC for how long have you been in the MEAC? Five years now. Five years? Um, yes. Field judge, is that correct? Okay. Correct. Also, Anthony Fleming. Anthony Fleming, he's in the Big 12. Um, I don't, Anthony, how long have you been in the Big 12 now? Uh, I don't know. What, eight years, eight, nine years? Something like that. So he's been in a long time, guys. So the guys presenting have a lot of experience. So just please, um, if you can, uh, just listen up real close. And if you can't, if you're not here, if you're listening on the recording, um, hopefully you can get out of what these guys uh, have to say. So, guys, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, I'm going to mute my phone and turn my camera off. And then we'll listen in and monitor the chat. All right? Good luck, guys. Sounds good. Well, guys, hey, we wanted to uh, welcome all the, the deep officials, all officials from DFOA to another virtual uh, training. I uh, want to take the time to first thank everybody uh, in front of us, the referees and umpires, the headlinesmen, uh, the short flanks, uh, line judges. They did a phenomenal job with the virtual training for the first two, uh, first two sessions. Guys, this is a work in progress. Uh, this is something new that the chapter has really jumped on, and we want to thank everyone for taking the time to uh, give us an hour and a half of the day to, to get some sense of normalcy and think about some football for a little bit. So without further ado, we won't take up too much of your time. Please, if you have questions, remember to uh, place them into the, uh, to the chat room, the chat box. That will be monitored and we'll make sure we get those questions answered as quickly as possible uh, if it's not addressed within the uh, presentation itself. We want to start off with uh, just a little thing of preparation, guys. As you kind of see, I put, put this slide up. Just want to see why do we prepare to be, become officials? We prepare to because we want to gain confidence, guys. We want to be successful in the role that, that we partake in and being out there on the field. We always ask if you can, can you be over prepared, right? Am I, am I over prepared? We all think it's easier to be under prepared than over prepared. So if you're taking the time to assess yourself and, and put yourself in the right predicament, we feel like you'll always be a good official. And you ask, what do we prepare for? Typical high school game, even college games now, don't have about 150 plays per game. Um, every official is going to have two or three calls, possibly at most. You know, those are your money calls. We think it sounds easy, but if it was, if it was easy, everybody would be officiating. So how do we prepare? You know, that's the question. That's the test. That's what we're trying to figure out. How do you prepare? A couple of different ways of uh, preparation that we have. You know, you got your physical preparation, year-round conditioning program, staying in shape. And for everybody that wants to tell me round is the shape, I get it. Round is the shape. Um, but... We know that for everyone, uh, there are different age sets, there are different uh, demographics, there are different uh, sizes and builds. Being in shape is just making sure that your cardio-wise and cardiovascular, that you're able to run up and down the field with these 16- and 17-year-old kids. Um, try, to, try to set and maintain some type of a goal uh, as it pertains to your weight. If it's to stand pat, that's a goal. If you want to lose five pounds, that's a goal. Um, Set that goal and try to maintain it and hold yourself accountable to doing it. At the end of the day, we all know that perception is reality in officiating. If, if you look bad, you probably are. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind from a physical standpoint. From a mental preparation standpoint, you know, uh, Yogi Bear said, said it best. He said baseball is 90% mental and the other half is physical. As you can kind of read, yeah, the math is off, but you get the point. Know the game. Know football. Know what you're officiating. Don't just throw out questions or throw out answers if you don't know it. Get the answer. Seek it. Find out if it's from a, another co-official, if it's from a referee in your, on your crew. 
uh, maybe your study groups or something like that. Those will be the type of people you'll get that from. Uh, attend study groups. Here we are in the off season. If you're on this call, you've already done that. So you, you, you already got one of the uh, checkpoints off. Watch as much film as you possibly can. We ask that you watch as much film as you can, preferably the games that you work because you can learn from your own mistakes. Um, we all watched the Super Bowl a couple years ago, and uh, we know that everybody learned from that mistake as a deep official. So if everybody else is going to learn from it, why not take the opportunity to learn from yourself? Watch as much film of yourself as you possibly can. DFOA has invested a lot of time and effort into huddle and being a lot more uh, stringent on huddle and, and, and getting that information out. Uh, Steve, over the, the past years, was able to get it out. Xavier uh, will continue to do that as it comes up. Continue to look at as much film as you possibly can, especially of yourself. Um, your season preparation, you know, there are a couple things that – we're set up a little different with our crews, and we know that with our crews that um, the referee kind of has a hand-on approach, and he can kind of select some of those guys, uh, some of your co-officials, and you're going to be there. But at the same time, there may be some, some personality conflicts. There may be um, an age uh, conflict or you know situation that's there. Regardless of the fact, control what you can control, and that's – how you work within that crew. Leave your ego at the house. Leave it in the parking lot. Leave it at work. When you're on that field, be a part of the crew. Be as best as you can possibly be uh, and the strongest official you can possibly be. And I tell you from a college standpoint, from a high school standpoint, it doesn't matter. We just had the draft, and DFOA had another successful draft. Uh, you guys seen a lot of the information that was out there. And once again, I definitely want to applaud the board for – for doing something that has never been done in DFOA history, and I'm sure that Ty and those guys will talk about it when we have our first general session meeting. Mm -hmm. But to know the amount of games that were scheduled and what was put out there, don't complain about your schedule. Work the game that's in front of you. Each game gives you an opportunity to become a better official, regardless if it's a six-man or a 6A game. If you're working it, you'll become a better official. Um, Last thing for me right now, guys, I want to talk about just for your game preparation. Always be early. My supervisor right now, and I even heard it from Charles years ago, if you're on time, you're late. So be early. I do understand. We all understand. We know what's going on with traffic and work and life and kids. We completely understand that. But know that when you're out there to work that game that you mentally have given yourself an opportunity to be the best official you possibly can be. And if you're there and you're there early, you'll be, you'll be able to be there and be ready to work. Your first impression is going to be key. You only get one chance to make your first impression. A lot of you suckers have been mad a couple times because you didn't do it right the first time. Think about it. I mean, that's what we're up against, your first impression. So be prepared to participate in any pregame discussion. You, you know the stigma for the, for the deep official. We'll talk about a, a – uh, uh, a, little, a little longer in the uh, program or the, uh, in the presentation, but just make sure that you are ready to participate. Make sure that you're bringing something to that pregame. We're not just that sixth and seventh official. We're out there to actually work and make sure that everybody knows what we're there to do. And if you know, if you know field judge, you should know side judge. So you know two positions. You don't just know one. And if you know both of those positions, then you should know back judge as well. If you know what each deep official does, it makes you a better official. I'll leave with the last thing, guys, and that's just being active in the team's pregame and warm-ups. Uh, Howard is about to take over. He's going to have a couple things for you that will talk about that, but just make sure that you are completely active in your team warm-ups. And I'll go ahead and pass it over to Howard. Howard, are you available? Yes, I am. Thank you, Brandon. No problem. All right, this next slide is basically uh, the week before, the week of, how do you prepare for the game. Some of these resources have been mentioned in the first two sessions. I would highly recommend, if you're not already part of this face group, Facebook group, Texas High School officials, go ahead and get yourself uh, as part of that group. There are a lot of good discussions out of uh, film clips that are submitted 
and I think you'd uh, you'd benefit by uh, participating in that group. Uh, this next item here, as far as ro the rule book and mechanics, I mean, why are we out there on the field? Why are they paying us to be out on the field? We have got to know the rules and the mechanics, okay? Uh, this is an ongoing thing. This is not just uh, during football season. I would highly recommend keeping you active off season as well. For the new guys, uh, you know, where do you find the rule books? Where the, all the mechanics books from the three up to the seven are all out on the TASO website. Just log in, go to the members uh, portal page. This next uh, section here, as far as preparing your game bag, it's it mentions a lot of things re related to like the back judge, but uh, this is one of the biggest points of consternation and problems in going and arriving at the game site. This thing, I swear, I, I myself probably pack my bag two or three times before I leave the house. Uh, and everyone's got stories of either forgetting this or forgetting that. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, for me to pack and unpack and then repack, it's just a way that I can assure myself as best as I can that I've got everything I need. And uh, specific to the back judge, make sure you've got, if you've got a 2540 timer, Make sure you got watches. If you got a recorder, make sure it works. Don't forget your comm devices. Uh, uh, I think it was in 2018, Tasso came out with that 2540 clock tip sheet, and that's uh, you can find that out on the Tasso website as well as in the it's now in the uh, Seven Man Mechanics Manual at least, uh, page 22, I think, section seven. When the, when they first came out with that, I mean we were giving them out left and right to the clock operators. And actually, I think last year uh, when I tried to give some of these out, they, they actually still had them. And it's a great thing, uh, you know, at the high school level, if you're lucky, you know, you get either officials, current officials, or ex-officials that are working the clocks, and that is great. But for the vast majority of these games, you're getting either a stadium manager or a dad that drew the shortest straw, uh, et cetera. So uh, it's a great tip sheet for those people uh, to have on hand. Uh, I try to take spares of everything. Everyone takes spares, pens, pencil, markers. I, I carry a couple uh, air pumps and a, and a gauge on, on top of that. Uh, you know, think about the the weather, weather conditions. Uh, conditions uh, of the upcoming game. Is it cold weather, uh, you know, coordinate long sleeve, short sleeve? A lot of crews will take both and decide uh, somewhere short for the first half, long for the second. Uh, is rain a consideration? Are you on a grass field? Uh, you know, if it's known to be mud, you might uh, not want to wear your Sunday best shoes. Maybe you got a, a backup pair that you can use, so. Uh, this next slide is actually uh, for the pregame itself. And as Brandon mentioned, you know, be there no later than on time. I mean, you know, we try to be there an hour and a half before time. You know, coordinate with your crew. Uh, again, you know, back judge when you're in the pregame, make sure everything works. Test your, your timing devices. Make sure your recorder works if you're there using that. Uh, you know, you're going to be responsible for all the intervals, timeouts, time between quarters, et cetera. If you're lucky enough that the teams bring their game balls to the locker room, and it's not that common, so if they do, go ahead and get them certified. We want them to be new or newly new. Uh, that's pretty liberal, but uh, they should be about 12 and a half to 13 and a half pounds of pressure each. Uh, one thing I will say about that, and uh, I had something happen to me uh, in a game where uh, it was terrible conditions, raining and stuff, and I, th uh, I think the team may have only checked four games. It was one of these four balls before the game or something. Uh, but after the game, uh, one of the chain people mentioned that he thought uh, he seen one of the coach, you know, assistant coaches on the sideline or something marking balls and, and bringing them in. So uh, you might, I don't know. As a suggestion, and I do this too, uh, use a different color. Use a green or a orange or something to, to maybe help prevent that. But uh, 
yeah, we're going to work with these teams as best as possible. Uh, but I think we don't want them marking their own balls and trying to get them in. So, uh, I think we've all been in games where, you know, a ball tries to, you know, they throw a ball in and say, where the heck this ball come from? It, you know, it looks like it has your mark, but uh, it, just, it doesn't seem right. So, uh, you know, the side judge here, you know, you're you're the guy. If the if the game clock goes out, man, it's all on you. You know, so you know at least have a primary and backup watch, and and you know make sure they work. And and most importantly, make sure you know how to use the things. Make sure you know how to set the thing to 24, you know, 12 minutes or uh, whatever the clock uh, the game clock was when it went out. You know, make sure you know how to set the thing to get to that point so you can start uh, at that. Um, you know, if you're lucky, again, uh, if you got clock uh, operators that are chapter guys, they're usually pretty good about being there ahead of time. Uh, or, you know, sometimes uh, these stadiums, they won't even come to the locker room and you have to go chase them down. So uh, I think this next sheet, uh, or next slide, Brandon, is a uh, discussion on the uh, that you can have. It's a busy, sli uh, busy slide, but the, it's basically an I I point checker for uh, anyone reviewing this uh, this uh, presentation. They can quickly find this slide, and it's just a, a bunch of tips uh, to go over with the clock instructor. Um, you know, like I said, if, if you got a chapter assigned or an ex official, most you know they're pretty good. They they know most of this stuff. It's just when you run into a new guy. Uh, or a non-chapter guy. I mean, there's you just need to kind of feel out and, and ask as much as you can of them to find out if you're, you know, are they having any problems to date? Uh, you know, make sure they, they sync their watches with the back judge, side judge, so that, you know, everyone's on the same page as far as starting uh, the game on time. Uh, again, if they don't have the 2540 tip sheet, get them, you know, give them one. Tell them to place it up in the uh, press box and keep it there. Uh, you know, find out what your referee wants to do on the horn and let the, these guys know. A lot of officials, uh, you know, the referees, maybe they don't want the horn to go off at the end of the quarter. Some do. So just make sure that the clock operators are in sync with that. We always have them uh, run a count on uh, just so everyone at the stadium knows uh, how soon the game is going to start. We want to make sure that they exercise all the functions on the scoreboard and the clocks, make sure we don't have any problem there. You know, they should know that if any one play clock goes out, you know, we got to shut them both off. If we have a, an issue on the game clock, you know, it, it's going to be out of service. The, the side judge is going to take care of that, and we'll try to keep everyone apprised of the, the time as best we can. Uh, try to find out where these clock operators are located in the press box in case you have to communicate with them. Uh, and, and most times, uh, you know, you can go to the home team side, talk to the coaches. They've got a, a comm set up to their uh, assistant coaches up in the, the box, and they can get in touch with them. Uh, make sure the clock operators know the signal from the referee on setting the 25-40-second uh, play clock. Uh, we always tell them to, to start, you know, make sure the at the beginning of the game the play clock set to 25 for the free kick. And if we have a delay a game, leave the thing set at zero. Do not reset it. Uh, there was a good discussion, I think, in the, the referee. I think Jeff uh, made a little uh, talk about the 10-second runoff. You know, make sure they're aware of that. Um, you know, another tip is on the game clock, be just a half a second slow to start on plays from scrimmage and such. You know, there's a lot of times you have a delay a game, and, you know, next thing you know, you look at the clock, and it's got six seconds run off or something. So, you know, do what we can to kind of prevent any massive timing issues. Uh, same with the play clock. We kind of, like, after a, a free kick or what, anytime you're going to have squad changes, uh, you know, kind of delay on that. After scores, you know, we kind of tell them to wait for the referee signal. Uh, you know, advise them to be alert for timeouts in the second and, and fourth quarter. But, you know, that can happen at any time depending on the game situation. Uh, you know, they should be aware if, if we got 
sideline plays, you know, you're going to see officially may give you two signals, you know, but that's just indicating to everyone that the, the ball's in bounds and we've got a first down where we're stopping it. Uh, you know, for the halftime, we always have them set, uh, you know, if it's a 28-minute half, sometimes it's shorter, but 28-minute uh, max, so we want them to set it to that and watch for the referee's uh, signal. So... Okay, Brandon. Uh, okay. When we get the field, we want to try to go out as one unit, keep everyone together. Uh, we also want to make sure everyone, uh, you know, it was mentioned in the previous sessions, you know, you can't stress this enough. I mean, yeah, everyone's watching you. you got the stripes on out there. You know, everyone's got cameras. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'd advise, you know, just try not to crack up, make jokes and stuff like that. Uh, you know, be professional. Uh, when you're out on the field, you know, uh, walk the field, make sure the clock operation is, is functioning properly. Uh, I can't stress enough, as it was mentioned in previous uh, sessions, work each team as they, they run their scrimmage plays and stuff, uh, you know, you get to know uh, their receivers. Maybe you're you're working a team that's got a great you know, receiver or a great running back or great quarterback. Uh, you know the stars of the team. Uh, you know, can the quarterback throw a long pass or is it a duck? You know, can the receivers? Catch? What about the kickers, the punters? Are, can the punters are they punting deep? Can they do they have the, the leg to do that? Can their Field goal guy kick a 40 yarder, or can they barely make a 15? Uh, you know, is the pre kicker driving them through the end zone? You know, that kind of thing. Or, yeah, you never know at that high school level what you're going to get. So this is a, a great opportunity to kind of get an insight as to what kind of skill sets these guys have. Uh, and and again, echo I think what was said in the the short flying presentation. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity to get out there. You know, feel free to talk to the guys. Uh, you know, let them know you're out there, you're working the game. I mean, uh, you know, you don't want to be an adversary to them, and they, you don't want to perceive you as an adversary. So uh, this is also the time where the, the field judge, side judge, uh, get to find out who the ball people are, uh, you know, who's marked balls, Certify them in the lock. Uh, make sure that they are on the sidelines ready to go. Uh, you know, times we end up having to do that out on the field, so that's not so much an issue. So, uh, if you move to the next slide, uh, Brandon. Okay, this is another busy slide and a discussion point, guys. Uh, uh, and certainly, you know, with the chat being interactive, uh, you you. Uh, experienced guys, uh, any tips and things that you guys have, not only with the ball people here, but also uh, with the clock operators and stuff. You know, fill that chat session up as we go through and, and add your recommendations and things. Uh, you know, we're, we're here to exchange and, and learn information. So the more uh, contributory we can be, the better off. So uh, this is just a, a bunch of things that, uh, you know, to, to talk with the ball people. You know, it's, it's important to get their names and use their names when you when you call them. Uh, you, know, you might want to find out their skill level. Have they done this before? Is it their first time? Uh, some of these, I mean, I've worked games where they've only had one ball person, and you know, other games where maybe they had four. And, and sometimes when you have the one guy, he's he's better than two guys or three guys. So, uh, you know, you, you never know what you're going to get. So uh, do do what you can up front to. Uh, to find out what you're in for, uh, you know, we don't want the ball people on the on the field. The only time we want them out there, I would say, is is when the on three kicks. We got to get that tee off the field, and you know, as a back, uh, you know, I kind of watch for that. I mean, after the play is is over, that's one of the first things I'm looking for to make sure that tee gets off the field, or they've got someone coming out to get it. If I don't see anyone coming out, then I make a point to go out and get it and, and throw it off to whatever side uh, just kicked off. I mean, it's nothing nothing worse than uh, starting the next series and you know even or having the play come through and the tees on the field or or you backing up and you know twist an ankle on the on the thing. So um, 
uh, you know, just just cover that. Uh, most of I'll tell you what, uh, most of these games lately, we've only been having the ball people on their side of the field. I don't know how much of this split field uh, operation is being done, but you know, talk to them how you're going to do the mechanics. Uh, you know, if, if they've got at least two people, you know, it's good to have one with the short flank, one with the deep flank. You know, position them, tell them where you want them to work. You want them to work, you know, downfield, upfield. You know, you you want them back away from you for sure. Uh, but you know, go over, over all those things with you. Um, how are you going to do the ball mechanics? You know, scrimmage plays. Uh, pass plays, whether it's complete, incomplete. Um, you know, talk to them about extra points and field goals. How you're gonna, you know, where do you want the new ball? Or you want to, you know, put behind the uprights? Is someone gonna be on the sideline with a, a ball for the kickoff, et cetera? So, uh, you know, main thing is, you know, just engage with them. You know, tell them to have a good time, stay safe above all things, enjoy the game. You know, uh, the more you can keep them engaged engage here, the the better opportunity you're going to have that they're going to stick with you. These kids, uh, especially if there's more than one or two, uh, you know, they, they their their mindset, their attention span is, is different. They're off uh, more concerned with, uh, you know, being with their friends or what have you. So uh, just keep them engaged and in, in, in near you, and I think you'll, you'll avert a lot of those problems. So the next slide there, Brandon. Okay, I think these next two slides are just thrown out there uh, as a reminder uh, of the 2019 changes to the uh, short and uh, deep flanks where they uh, start off on the uh, opposite side of the field to uh, get your uh, head linesman and uh, side judge starting off in the press box side and the field judge and uh, line judge on the opposite side. So. Uh, and we all know that the chains don't move. They stay on, you know, opposite the press box. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Brandon. And again, after all said and done, this is just basically getting us on the right side, the correct side of the field to uh, get ready for the, uh, the coin toss. So you want to move to the next one, Brandon? Okay, and this is just a, a, a visual. You have reached the maximum time permitted to record. To send your message, press 1 at any time. To listen to your message, press 2. To re-record, press 3. For more options, press 4. To cancel, press star. Okay, not sure what that was. <laughs> yeah, okay. Don't worry about it, guys. Let's keep going. Yeah, okay. This is just a visual... The thing on this before the coin toss is that, you know, got to get the captains the 50-yard line four minutes before the game. Uh, what's important about that is uh, when you're out warming up with the teams and everything, find out where these teams are going to be. If they have, you know, some of these teams have these visitors locker room in the next county, and it, it may take Sorry, you two or three. please try again later. Thank you for calling. Goodbye. It may take you two or three minutes or longer just to get to the visiting team's locker room. So take that into account when you're getting ready for a coin toss. You know, it may take you a total of 10 minutes or so just to go out there and back and get them. So uh, the main thing is, you know, do what you need to do to get these captains on the sidelines four minutes beforehand. So, uh, Brandon, you can go to the next slide. And this is the actual, uh, again, taken from the manual uh, of the procedure itself. The field judge, side judge, you know, no more than four captains. Get them lined up. You know, walk them out. You stop at the nine-yard mark. Send them over uh, to the uh, referee and umpire. Uh, if you know other captains and or the rest of the team, sometimes they want to send them out. You know, make sure they don't go out any further than those nine-yard marks. Uh, a lot of times they won't teams or other captains won't come out. So if that's the case, then go ahead and uh, go back to your uh, sideline. Um, and I think that's it on it. After the toss, you know, either the back judge or side judge, you know, make sure you got the game ball of the team that's going to be kicking and bring it out to, 
to the center of the field for uh, your starting position. So, Brandon, I think that was the transition point. All right. Uh, this, fellas, we're going to go over the uh, the free kicks and a couple of things here. As the game is uh, getting ready to start, during your pregame where you walk around, check to see where all the clocks are. The worst thing you can do is, you know, a play happens during the game, you try to figure out where the clocks are. So identify every clock on the field, know where they are, and so then as the kickoff is getting ready to happen, you want to verify that the clock is set to 12 minutes and you are ready to go prior to the kick. Uh, you want to get those teams off the sideline. You want to get them onto the field prior to the kick. And then as they're lining up and the referee goes to blow his whistle, before he blows his whistle, you want to count both the kicking team and you want to count the receiving team. Uh, if you have 11 on both sides, then you sit them across to your partner, which is the uh, field judge, the side judge, and for the back judge, it will be the uh, umpire. Uh, do not let them kick off with less than 10 people on the field or more than 11 on the field. That's something that, you know, prevent officiating. You can get that knocked out. You don't have to worry about that foul occurring. Um, see, uh, be prepared for anything. So as, as you get ready for the kickoff, you put in your mind that uh, the ball may fall off the tee. You know, what do I do? Kill the clock, let the kicker put it back up. The back judge, you go out there, hand it to him again. Let the referee blow, you go to the sideline. If you have a surprise onside kick, it can happen. I've seen it happen from the opening kickoff. If I have a pooch kick or if they traditionally kick it deep, but you have to be prepared for all those situations at all times. Understand the mechanics necessary based on the type of kick play uh, you get. Uh, onside, do I have a me bag in my hand? If, is the, if, if the ball is kicked towards me, what do I do? If the ball is kicked away from me, what do I do? And so you have to be prepared to be think about all these things as the kick is coming up. And the best thing that you or the thing that you're hoping for is you kick it deep and you don't have to worry about it, you know, running all over the place trying to figure out what I need to do next. But if you're thinking about it, it comes easy. Um, You also want to uh, pick up any signals. You know, you know, if they push the ball deep, then one of the guys up front wave for a fair catch prior to the guy deep catching the ball. You know, you want to be aware of those type of things. Um, did, did they kick the ball off the tee into the air? Did they kick it straight up in the air? Did it bounce on the ground two or three times? If it bounced one time, what happens? If it bounced two or three times, who can recover it? Uh, who has possession of the ball, can they advance the ball. All these things have to be going through your head as they're preparing to make the kick. Once the kick is made, uh, what you want to do is you want to allow the players to go past you at least five yards uh, before uh, you start moving downfield. And once you move downfield, you want to move down maybe five or ten yards. You want to set up and you want to officiate. Um, and then so as we go into these slides, we're going to uh, – cover some areas of responsibility. Uh, that goes into the second half kickoff where you just flop. Um, and just so you know, uh, the tape I'm using, they're kicking off from the 35, but my understanding in the high school game, uh, you guys use the 40. So we're just going to go with this. Mechanically, we're just going to go with this. All right, so as you can see, I have uh, two teams here. Uh, and the reason why I uh, use this slide is because it's a, it's a non-traditional a kickoff setting. Uh, you have to make sure that you have at least, uh, what is it, four on each side of the kicker? Yeah. At least four on each side of the kicker uh, at the kickoff. Uh, and as these guys approach the line, back judge, the umpires, make sure that none of these guys cross the line prior to the ball being kicked. You want to make sure that these guys are on, on sides, which in, in the high school game, which would probably be the 50. Uh, and so then, as they start to approach the line, they move down this way, down the field. As they cross you, side judge, field judge, once they get at least four or five yards past you, you want to turn and you want to move down at least, uh, like I said, five, ten yards and you want to officiate. And what we're going to next is just kind of uh, – this is here is kind of busy, uh, but what I want to cover is that uh, – I used to uh, identify players and follow them down the field, but what happens on kickoffs, it gets to a point where it looks like a big uh, mess. Somebody stepped in the amp power and these folks are all over the place. So what we transitioned to last year is that we do areas of responsibility. We divide 
for the uh, kickoff guys up front, we divide the field into fours. So we will have the uh, the side judge, if you're at the bottom, you're going to cover from the numbers to the sideline. The back judge, which comes in here, uh, will cover from this uh, number, a little bit inside the numbers, to over here to the middle of the field. The umpire that's coming in from the top of the screen was going to cover from this portion of the field over towards almost to the numbers, and then the field judge is going to cover the middle uh, sideline from here to the sideline. Okay. And that way, uh, if you're watching players in these areas, instead of watching uh, uh, a player that you identified at the beginning of the kickoff, you, it's easy to pick up more fouls. And what you're looking for, as you see, uh, here we have a player that's running backwards, but this guy's not engaged. So at this point, we're waiting for them to get closer before we pick up any action on these guys. These guys are closer being, uh, to being engaged, so that's a hot spot. Um, I was dealing with uh, areas of responsibility because for the side judge, there's nobody in his area of responsibility. It is okay for you to move from this area over some to pick up players. Uh, we're not here to officiate air. If you want to officiate air uh, and watch the game, you need to give up your uniform, buy you a ticket and some popcorn and go sit in the stands because that's not we there. We're not there for that. All right. And it just gives you, uh, gives you a better view of those areas of responsibility. Like, again, here's the uh, kicking team up here on this end, the receiving team here. Uh, and what, you know, most guys, uh, most kicking coaches, what they try to do is they try to kick the ball to the corner. So if I'm looking at this formation as a field, uh, side judge, automatically know that this kicker is going to kick this ball down in this corner because the formation. You know, there's too many guys on this side of the inside of the numbers for him to kick it over here. All right, let me, I'm going to move to a different slide here, uh, which makes it a little bit cleaner. All right, so here's your areas of responsibility. So side judge, you're going to take this area to the sideline. Those players within those, uh, within this area, that's what you look for. That's what you appreciate. And we're going to look, or what are we looking for? Uh, you have to understand what types of fouls would happen uh, during the kickoffs, and I'm going to cover that in a second. So side judge, you're here to the sideline. Uh, back judge, you come in. You come in about middle of the numbers. You're going to take this area to about middle of the field. The umpire is going to come in. He's going to take this area over to here, then field judge, you going down the sideline five, ten yards, and you covering from here back to the sideline. Those players within that area. The type of fouls we are looking for uh, on kicks, on free kicks, uh, you have holding. For us, you know, if he just grabbing a guy, tugging on the jersey, running down the field, you know, I know this is probably on a different level, but. We want them to be big files on the kickoff. So if you just tug on the uh, jersey. For recording your message. If you are satisfied with your message, press 1 to listen to your message. Press 2 to erase and re-record. Press 3. She kind of bossy, almost like a wife. I didn't know we brought a wife. I'm sorry if there's any ladies. <laughs> uh, I apologize. Uh, I take that back. <clears throat> so you want big files. So oh, hold it. The holder has to be one that takes a guy completely to the ground or turns him completely around. That's what we're looking for. You have blocks in the back. Uh, yeah, uh, guy just riding him down the field, riding down the field. As long as he's touching him on the side, then he pushes him. It may look like it's in the back, but as long as it's from the side, you don't want that. You want guys that are separated in space, and then they come together, and you have a block in the back. That's what you're looking for, big things. Uh, block below the waist. We know on kickoffs, on all kicks, change of position, there's no blocking below the waist. So if you see it, it's obvious. It's going to jump out at you. Uh, blind side block is a big deal that they're trying to get out of the game. You have a guy that want to run from one side of the field all the way across here to uh, take a kill shot. We want to get that type of thing out of the game for the safety of these kids. Of course, targeting. Uh, you can have a block in the back. Believe it or not, we're targeting. <laughs> you can you got blindside block. We're targeting. So anytime a player is going high, 
again, something they're trying to get out of the game. And, of course, we, you know, we get a back, back judge to ball. Uh, we don't want to let a game um, kickoffs, but sometimes it happens. And so, uh, again, if you guys have any questions, uh, I'm always available to answer those. You can uh, get my number from uh, the powers to be from the DFOA, and I'm going to pass it on to the next presenter. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> Flem. This is Terrell, everyone. Thanks for joining us here tonight. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here and glad that you were able to make it and take some time out of your evening. Uh, I want to talk to you about pre-snap routine. Uh, what's a routine? Routine is a habit. It's a sequence of actions that really doesn't vary. Uh, it's synonymous with uh, a procedure, a pattern, a regimen, a method, a system, a groove. So let's talk about getting in your groove. But first, Colin Powell once said, if you're going to achieve excellence in big things, you develop the habit, again, you develop the habit in little matters. Excellence is not an exception, it's a prevailing attitude. So let's talk about forming these habits and getting into this groove. Before we have the pre-snap routine, earlier in the week and even before you get to the game, we need to document this routine. Let's write it down. Let's put it in your phone, put it in a tablet, on a computer. Because if you write it, you're going to remember it. But not only just writing it will help you to remember it, you must review it. Let's review it throughout the week. Let's review it just before the game, when you're pre-gaming in the locker room. Sometimes folks might look at me and watch me reading something, and that's what I'm doing. I'm going over a checklist that I have. I've been doing this a lot of years, but not as many as some, but I still have to go back and remind myself what am I about to do, getting my mind mentally prepared for the game that's about to take place. So now we're on the field. Before the pre-snap routine, let's talk about finishing the previous play. You want to check the game clock and the play clock status. You want to dead ball officiate. Brandon's going to talk a little bit more about dead ball officiating. And also you want to make sure that you've got sound ball mechanics, getting the ball off the field that needs to get off the field and getting the right ball on the field. So the pre-snap routine, now we're ready. This play is about to start or we're in between plays, rather. Again, we're going to check the game clock and the play clock. Is the game clock running? Should it be running? Is the game clock stopped? Should it be stopped? Let's communicate that appropriately to the referee. Believe it or not, the referees depend on a lot of officials on the field for very small but important duties. A lot of times they may get a little confused and they want to confirm with officials downfield, like any of the deep officials or anybody on the field that's understanding the game clock status. Play clock status. It's primarily the back judge's responsibility, but also the side judge and field judge are back there to help him out. Sometimes back judges fall asleep, and I once was a back judge and I fell asleep. That's why I moved to side judge, field judge. I missed the delay of game. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, um, let's see. We, we want to move to substitution mechanics after that. You know, when the previous play ends out of bounds and you're on the offense sideline, if you decide judge, feel judge, and that play goes out of bounds into the offense team area, you want to iron cross, whether they're subbing or not. So we're going to iron cross that and let the referee know that, uh, that we've got subs coming in, whether we do or don't, because the play ended out of bounds on the offensive sideline. If their offense subs come in and we want to do an iron cross only if there's a no huddle or a late sub. Because if they're in the huddle, it's really not that important. Some crews have that, that same mechanic no matter what because they want to get in the groove and the rhythm of doing that. But there's no reason to hold up the, the defense from subbing because they are in the huddle. Um, if you're the field judge and side judge, you want to set up 20 to 24 yards downfield. And everybody says, wow, that's a, that's a big variance. And used to be 20. Well, the kids, we used to be faster and we used to be younger. The kids are getting faster and we're getting older and we're getting a step slower. So get comfortable between 20 and 24 yards. And you don't have to be on the same yard line, field judge, side judge. Just find a comfortable spot to be able to get yourself ready to officiate this play that's about to happen. But most importantly, the bad judge should be five yards beyond the field judge and side judge. 
So most back judges say, no, mechanics manual said I have to be 25 yards off the line of scrimmage. Well, that looks a little crazy if the back judge is 25 yards from the line of scrimmage and the field judge and side judge are 24 yards from the line of scrimmage. There's only a one-yard separation. So the back judge needs to be a little flexible and, mark, and, and set up five yards behind the field judge and side judge, whichever one's deeper, okay? Uh, you want to count the defense several times. When I say several times, I mean as many times as you can count them to be sure that you have the number that you have on the field. Once you have that count confirmed, you want to you want to relay that and communicate that with a signal to your other deep officials. And be sure that you're counting before you confirm, because that doesn't look good at all if you're out there and you're saying I've got 11 and you've got 12. And now you now you're throwing people off. So you, you've got to, and you're not really counting either. So you have to count the defense. That's very important. Down and distance. You have to know the down and distance. You want to communicate that with your adjacent officials, you, which down it is. Understanding the distance is also important. A lot of officials don't really put that into their pregame routine. Understanding that distance and the down with the distance helps you understand what's about to probably what's about to happen. Creating situational awareness. Third and forever kind of tells you what's about to happen. Third and forever means they're probably going to pass the ball. Okay, so you have to understand time and circumstance, game awareness, down and distance. All of that helps you to prepare for what's about to happen. You don't want to assume, but you want to mentally prepare for what's about to take place. And also you want to switch a down indicator. Remember to do that as all. That goes without saying, but you want to remember to do that. Once you do that, you want to identify the initial keys. And if, is your initial key pressed or in the press coverage? Is the defender right in front of the wide receiver, the widest guy, if, if you're the field judge, side judge? Is your key pressed? If your key is not pressed, then you want to widen your vision and look in and help out, help the back judge or help your line of scrimmage official by looking at <clears throat> those matchups that are out there. In most cases, they're going four wide, five wide sometimes, or four, five, five wide, yeah, sometimes five wide. Um, but nevertheless, you want to recognize that formation. The next thing you want to do is check your surroundings. You want to make sure that the sideline is clear, not just in front of you, between you and your line of scrimmage partner, but behind you as well. Uh, you want to help your line of scrimmage guy have that path that he's about to come down the field to, uh, to, to officiate and get that spot. So make sure the sight lines are clear. And the way you do that without moving out of position is just verbally, politely, professionally say, please step back. Please step back. And you can wave your arm in a nice professional way, not in a, demo not in a demonstrative way, not in an authoritarian way. Please step back. And they will respond to that. Next thing you want to do is get focused. Get ready what's about to happen. Okay? Take a look. Make sure you're focusing on your keys. And then the last thing is you want to check the play clock and help the back judge out. Again, the play clock may expire, and you want to be ready to just in case the back judge goes to sleep, if you feel just side judge. But more importantly, the back judge has to always check that play clock. And back judges, you know the mechanics. If the play clock is at zero, you look back, if the ball is still on the ground, you've got a delay of game. Flight clock is zero, and the ball is not on the ground, you don't have delay of game. So it's a simple mechanic. Next slide. So I put this on here because we've got a field judge that's going through his pre-snap routine, all the things I just talked about, all those things are going through his head. And you've got a coach that's complaining about what just happened. The main thing is get into the routine, that routine creates muscle memory. Continue to focus and remain professional at all times. Now, maybe Coach Saban's not really complaining about enough to really get you rattled, but you've got to stay calm because this next slide shows a coach that's very upset right now. And he's screaming at this guy, this side judge. But again, going through his mind, he's focusing on this next play. He's hearing him, but he's not being distracted. That's all I have for now, and I'll turn it over to Brandon. Of course, we know he was begging for a call there. Uh, that's how they ended up winning a national championship. 
just in case you wonder, my alliance is not with uh, LSU University. So, um, but mine is. <laughs> but Terrell's is. So, guys, uh, we definitely want to thank you for sitting in as long as you have. And if you've been following along with us on the call so far, we've kind of went through the progression of preparing yourself, getting ready to get into uh, get into the game, get the mental preparation that we had, the game prep of your rule studies and making sure that you got your bag packed and so on and so forth. And we're kind of walking you through what an everyday game game day uh, uh, would be like. And so we went through the coin toss, and now we, have the, we went through the free kick, and Terrell just talked about going into a, a, a scrimmage play or, or a pre-snap routine as it pertains to a scrimmage play. So we're going to go into scrimmage plays here. Um, we'll definitely – we're going to – we're going to skim it a little bit here, but we're, uh, we'll definitely get into it a lot more in depth in the second session. But I definitely want you guys to hang on with us and, and keep riding. So on a scrimmage play, guys, um, determining our priorities are keys, right? I'm not going to read to you on there because you can read it for yourself. But most importantly, knowing what our keys are and knowing who we're supposed to be focused on the most uh, gets us in the right in the right situation. As Terrell just alluded, knowing your key is definitely part of your pre-snap routine. And so, as a, it's, it's as easy as side judge, field judge. We know we got the furthest receiver on the outside, uh, most eligible uh, to to your side, or what we would consider as the number one receiver. Um, back judge, you're going to be reading the third receiver in trips, and you'll be reading the second receiver. Uh, in a balanced formation to the line judge side. Keep in mind that there are, there are some offenses where they'll run uh, double tight ends. Uh, they may run everything tight. That does not change our key. Uh, our key will still be, as the FS, the most eligible receiver on the outside, and the back judge, your key may change. And the strength uh, will possibly change due to uh, a motion of some sort. So. A lot of this you guys can already see uh, from the diagram is actually going to come straight out of the TASO manual. So you know what, what your key is, and if you don't, then we'll take the time to explain it to you a little bit more. Um, the general rule in this is you don't want to be keyed on a receiver if someone else could possibly be keyed on that same receiver, i.e. Your, your short flank. So this is a, um, a basic formation that we've seen probably 100 times in the game. Um, we, got, we got trips basically to the top of the screen, right? Um, we have the side judge. You're going to have the number one receiver out there on the outside, as I so eloquently put together in my beautiful PowerPoint that my son helped me with. Um, that's going to be yours, side judge or field judge. If you're at the top of the screen, you got that most eligible receiver, you got, that's you. Uh, the, the number two in this formation is either going to be the head linesman or line judge, depending on side of field. Um, and then the number three is going to be the back judge, which in this situation, it's, it could be a wing back. Um, I'll call him a wing back for lack of a better term here. That's going to be your key. Uh, we can get into, and we will get into a little bit more specific on is he in or outside of the tackle, if he's uh, all that. But for intents and purposes of this demonstration, he is outside of the tackle, and he is the most eligible receiver there. So we want the back judge key in on that. Um, side judge, field judge, our responsibilities are simple, uh, especially during a running play. We're watching for the action on that, on that, that outside receiver that's going to be out there. Um, whether they were the, the, the defender is in press coverage or if he's, and like in this example, where you can see that the, the DB is uh, giving him a favorable seven or eight yards, that looks like an easy first down if we need it. Uh, those are things that you'll look at as you're pertaining to and you're looking at your key, right? But if it's a run play, we're looking for crackbacks. Uh, we're looking for that receiver going back against the grain, that, the – the sayings that you've heard a hundred times over, the guy carrying the brick, uh, the, the fish swimming upstream, but whatever um, saying you've heard, that's what we're looking for on that. They also want to look for any blocking below the waist. Uh, make sure that we know the yard line that, that any of that blocking took place on. 
I try my best to, as you're 20, 22 yards uh, off the ball, I'm trying to make sure that I know where that three to five yard threshold is so I know where that blocking can take place. So as you're looking at it, just try to keep in mind or try to, you know, you want to try to eyeball that. And if you have a good short flank and your communication with him, he should definitely be able to help you uh, if you have any question on any of those blocks. It may be something where after the play is taking place, you may go down to your headlines or line judge and say, hey, did you see that block on my receiver? Do you know where exactly he was? And he may just immediately say, you know, hey, Brandon, oh, yeah, he was at three yards. Okay, perfect, and I can move on. Um, but if he tells me that, you know, he may have been a little bit pressed or a little bit further out, uh, closer to the five, then that's something I want to be aware of. Um, make sure that we're covering our sideline, guys. We want to make sure that if that play is coming to our side of the field, we got to help our H&L out as best as we can because they're trying to get that out-of-bounds spot. So as they're getting that spot and they do a good job of getting that, that's what they're paid to do. That's where they can get their money is getting those spots. We got to be in there to clean up that action. We got to be in there to make sure that if a player is going into an opposing a team bench, we have to go in there and get it. There's nothing else for us doing back there. We want to hurry to that spot. Don't rush, but we want to be in a, at, at a good pace, making sure we're getting that opposing team out of, out of that team area. As we're doing that, we also want to make sure that we escort him out. We're not just getting him, but we want to make sure we're escorting him out. And as we're doing that, don't worry about a football. That's the worst case of, of an official can do, be it young or old, uh, with a ball boy who's, who's doing his job, right? He, everything that Howard talked about earlier, earlier, and you've talked to him, you've trained him up, and he's ready, and he's so excited because he knows he has to get the ball in to you, but yet you're trying to get a player out. As far as long as I've been officiating, and I'm pretty sure Red Cash would tell you the same thing. They can't play a game without a football, so we take our time with it. As soon as we get the ball in, get into the umpire uh, to be able to get it spotted, and we can go ahead and get the next play going. Also, in that situation, we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're aware and we're staying alert for any late substitutions, any hideout plays, anything like that. If you – have the offensive side of the ball, Thrill uh, alluded to it. If a play ends in the side zone and you're on the offensive side, you immediately come out with the iron cross, whether they sub or not. If 11 goes, if 11 is a quarterback and he runs and he goes into his own bench area, you immediately comes out and he comes back into the field to play for the next down, you immediately come out with the iron cross and you'll allow – you're allowing the, your other co-officials to get that information and make sure that your referee releases you from that substitution mechanic so that he also has picked up on it. Uh, Frazier and Coop talked about it in the first session. That's what they're going to be looking for. And, and, you know, Jeff and Wasserman, all those guys, they're going to be looking for, well, hey, did he let them go in and out? They got too much going on. But they're going to eventually are going to pay into you. They're going to see that you got an iron cross. They don't need to know who it is. They just need to know that you have a sub. Back judge, your responsibilities are pretty similar as it pertains to on a scrimmage play, especially if it's a run play. Uh, you know, you're getting that action inside out. Um, you want to make sure that your blocks are going to be a little bit more key because they'll be a little bit closer to the, uh, to the action there. Uh, but that doesn't change anything. Uh, you're still looking to see if you have an eligible receiver. If, if that eligible receiver, if he's being pressed or, you know, if he's at, sitting off in coverage, um, but you also want to make sure that you're bracketing any type of long plays in between you and your F and S um, as you're to the middle of the field where they will be on the sideline. If it's a long play, you got the goal line. Uh, a good F and S will be there with you, uh, but it, ultimately it's yours on that long play. It's all you, you, and all you. That's, that's where you, you own it. And then the end line is only yours. Uh, we'll talk about that later on when we talk about goal line plays. You always want to be aware of the clock. You want to be aware of the clock. If it's inbounds, out of bounds, you can do a, a nice little signal uh, with just a little hand motion. You don't have to be demonstrative and wind the clock. That's not necessary. Uh, everybody knows what's going on there, so you can help pick that up. Um, make sure that if the, if, if, if the ball carrier breaks loose, you can help with a spot. And deep, we can all help with spots. 
that, that line judge and hit line, so they could be held up there uh, at the short line. And all you want to do is give them a ballpark. You don't have to give them a, an exact spot. If you think it's at the 40-yard line, it could be at the 39. 40, 40, 40 is what you're yelling, but you're backing out and allowing that line judge. Trust me, you're assisting, but they are going to have their own spot anyway. So all you want to do is assist. If you're wrong, you're wrong. They're going to get their spot. You just want to help get them in the ballpark. So uh, those are definitely some things that you can help on in the scrimmage play, especially for run play. Um, on a pass play, we're going to have a little bit more. Uh, uh, that's where we're going to make a little bit more of our money. As you guys, if you're watching film and you're trying to watch the films, uh, it's difficult to actually find the deep officials in, 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 in gang film. We're aware of that. Uh, but when we do, our calls are the big calls, right? We have the mo we average the most 15 yard calls. If it's DPI, uh, anytime we have you know uh, those DPIs, that they're looking at us, you know, and we get that one flag that comes out all game. Everybody named Mama remember that one. You don't remember the nine holding calls you had, but that one DPI. So let's make sure we're on our game. So we're observing any of that action on our on our receiver. Um, if they're not in press coverage, as you see in this slide here. You can look at one and two. Uh, one is your primary, but you can look at both of those receivers. The D-backs are five to eight yards off. They're, the receivers won't be fouled anytime soon. So as you're taking your read steps uh, for myself, and I'll let some of the other guys uh, speak for myself, when the ball is snapped, I'm taking one to two steps back. I mean, it is a casual one to two steps as I am reading the play. Um, I am doing that, and that will determine if I'm actually going to backpedal faster, if, if it's an actual run, uh, pass play. If it's a run play, I can sit still and keep my eyes still in that position. So, um, Terrell. Yep. On, on that note, you were talking about what you're looking at, and these guys are not in press coverage. Neither one or two are in press coverage on, either, press side. Coverage on either side. side. If you're the field, if you're the field judge or the side judge, what you want to do is um, – maybe peep over into the um, – take a look at the tackle to determine what's about to happen. You can take a, a sneak peek into the tackle. If the tackle is going to raise up, then obviously it's going to be a pass play. If the tackle is moving down the field, then it's going to be a run play. So that will help determine which direction you – not, not which direction you go in, but if you start backing up immediately. Because sometimes your key might not take you back because it might be a bubble screen or something like that. And you won't know that unless you kind of – you won't know if it's a passing play or a running play, but you can sneak over and look at the tackle and determine that in this situation because none of those guys are in press coverage. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, and, and get to the tackle, and, and that's that next level stuff, guys. I mean, and, and it, it, that's a very good key for uh, a very good deep flank. Once you get comfortable with that, looking at the tackle is – that's definitely the way to go because that tackle will tell you the play ten times out of ten. Um, I'm not going to uh, linger on this too much longer. Um, we will – I got one more slide that we'll talk about. We'll open it up for a couple of questions here. Uh, but I did want to kind of get into a little bit more of the responsibilities as it pertains to, the, you know, the pass play. We want to make sure we're keeping our cushion, guys. And, and watching film last year – one of the biggest um, hurdles that deep officials over the last couple of years have to get over is, is our mechanics, and that starts with our cushion. Um, we already got a 20-yard head start, so as fast as these kids are, uh, there's no, nothing wrong with them getting up on us, but if you're giving yourself the right amount of cushion and you recognize that they are picking up ground, there's a time that you need to turn your hips and go ahead and run, on, run up field. Um, if that kid has gotten within 10 yards of you, at our age, unless you're a track guy, 10 times out of 10, you're going to get beat. So at that point, you need to already have your hips turned, and you need to try to get to that goal line as quickly as possible uh, with also keeping an eye on that, on that player as best you can, especially if uh, there's a uh, defender there in chase mode. If it's just the ball carrier by himself, can't really do a whole lot to himself, so um, no need to really kind of get yourself caught up with that, but just make sure that you do transition out of your back pedal uh, and get to a good spot to be able to get to the goal line to rule on the play. Um, and mechanically, 
a question that I have, a, you know, a bunch of times, and, and, you know, where do you line up, Brandon? Where do you line up? I personally line up at 22, so I'm either at the second tick or I'm at a big line every single time. That sounds weird. We're looking at this play right here. So for me, I'm either going to be at the 48 going in or I would be at the 45, especially if they gain some yardage. So I'm either going to be at the second line or the big line every single time. So that's just the easy way for me mechanically and how I line up. Uh, I can still run with some of these kids. Uh, C.D. Lamb would probably blow right by me for you Cowboy fans. But, <laughs> hey, I was there. I was in the frame with them. So those are the kind of things that, you know, you just you kind of know that. But um, for the back judge, you have that motion man a lot of times. So that motion man can change your um, – your key or at least the strength of the formation. Make sure you are inside out as you were trying to, uh, as you're looking at him. And I mean inside out as in you are able to see both hands on, on your key to make sure that uh, he is free from fouling that. And that also allows you to see what that defender is going to do if he's trying to get off. Because if he's a motion man, he may be a tight end or one of those backs. And that linebacker or defensive end is going to try to chip him real quick off the line there or try to hold him up and getting out of a break. And if you're inside out, you have a, a lot better view of being out on the outside of him. You completely miss that inside arm, which is where a lot of defenders uh, attempt to grab. Um, don't set up too shallow, guys. Make sure you give yourself the cushion. I mean, we're at 25 as a, as, as, as a back judge, 22 as, as a deep flank. Uh, I think Fleming lines up at 25 now just because he's getting old. Um, but those are the kind of things that you do. So I think one of the questions, someone just asked a question in the chat right quick before we move on. It says, does field judge and side judge have to be directly across from one another? Great, great question, guys. No. Get to where you're comfortable. So the, the thing is, is I've watched guys uh, backpedal, and if that's not your thing, Get where you can officiate. Whether you backpedal them, whether you turn and run to the side, be there to officiate. Like Brandon said, you don't want to get beat deep if you are supposed to be at the money line. So whatever you need to do to officiate that play, that's where you get. And I think Rick Rich Cag said it best in the in the chat. It looks better if you're lined up across from one another, but it's not necessarily required. Typically, um, depending on um, who you're working with, if you're the same crew year over year, you kind of work on that. I look across the field and I see, I see my, uh, my field judge and he, he might be back a little bit or, or my side judge might be back a little bit further than I am. I'll just step back just to make it look good a little bit like that. But, you know, you just want to be comfortable. You just want to be comfortable. And if you, if you start lining up at 35, there are other positions. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be that far back, obviously. <laughs> there, are, there are, trust me. Um, great, great question in, in the chat, and that, and that is a question that you get a lot, a lot of. And for, like I said, for me, I just I'm on one of those those lines, and it's I think all these um, methods. What, most importantly, is what works best for you. Um, but in all these methods, there's a lot a lot of positive that that, that comes from it, and it's just more or less is where you are comfortable and where you can actually officiate. Um, I did put a go. I talked about goal line. I'm talk about goal line slightly. Um, the head linesman is always going to push and, and let us know as deep flanks um, when we need to go back. Don't always uh, anticipate, or the anticipate, but don't always assume that you're going to get pushed back. Now, the only reason why I say that is if the first down line is, you know, and if, they're, if we're at the eight and the first out, you know, your line is a seven or maybe at the seven and a half and this is too much, that headlines we might they may feel more comfortable with us being there at the at the goal line instead of being at the end line. Allow the the short flank and your sideline official to communicate that to you. But as one goes, we all go. So if that headlines and once he tells the side judge, side judge and field judge, you should be you should be making love to each other. I with your eyes. I would say something else, but I know this is being recorded. So. Um, that nonverbal communication that you are making on every single play, uh, it's, it's going to be key. Terrell talked about that. And so that, those are going to be things that you do 
to let let them know immediately, hey, get back. We're now in a day and age where we have radios, and you can communicate that uh, that way as well, and I think that's great. Uh, but as long as you are uniform and either being on the goal line together or being on the end line together. Um, I will go into more detail as it pertains to our duties. Uh, it's, it's actually short and sweet. We, when we're on the goal line, we have all spots inside of the two. So notice how I said that. Inside of the two, I allow my head linesman or line judge to get the spot at the two. Now, whatever you and your crew decide, you guys just make sure you're uniform. Um, they get paid for spots. I'll say it 100 times over, and they do a dang good job of it. So I'd rather them get that spot, and I'm, I'm going to defer to them. They may be coming downhill too fast and not even realize where they are, and it's easier for me to back out and allow them to own that spot as opposed to them running over me, and we, and look, we look like the Keystone Cops out there. So um, anything, will, that's when we're on the goal line. When we are on the end line, um, they, ha they own that spot, but we have the sideline, and we are to assist the back judge with the end line as a side field judge. Back judge, end line is yours all day long and twice on Sundays, brother. Uh, we definitely want to bracket that in on any type of tight plays, especially at the pylon. That's another time where we should be we should be we should be doing something with our eyes uh, before we rule. We saw what happened in the Seattle game years and years ago with the replacement officials uh, that decided one went up, one didn't, and all that and so on and so forth. If it's a touchdown now, it'll be a touchdown five seconds from now. So let's make sure that we communicate with each other as deep officials before we rule and go up, touchdown. Um, Fleming, uh, Terrell, do I have anything to add to that? Yeah, let's, let's go back. When, uh, when you're on the goal line, when the deep flanks are on the goal line, the back judge should never be on the goal line with the deep flanks, obviously. Sometimes you see that, um, see that happening. If the deep flanks move to the goal line, the back judge pushes to the end line, always. There should never be a situation where the three of you are on that goal line. Uh, in, in a regular scrimmage play like that. Secondly, when you're on that as, as a deep flank and you're on that goal line, you want to give yourself enough room to officiate the play without having to back up. So you've heard this before from the line of scrimmage guys, get that, get that pylon, that, that G, um, that's, that orange G, push it back as far as you can go. Make sure that nobody's behind you. Sometimes they have camera people out there, kids that are working for the yearbook and all that stuff and different media folks trying to get a shot down the goal line. They need to be back behind you where you are free and clear of any interference from them, of you getting hurt or them getting hurt or anybody getting injured on that play. So you want to give yourself enough room because, believe it or not, that play going to, could possibly end at your feet and it can take you out. Uh, as long as you're moving back, your eyes are moving. So you want to stay stationary and officiate with your eyes at that point. And then the last thing on that formation where the F and S are on the, on the end line, you, you're at that pylon. You have to be able to understand what's coming at you from a play perspective. As the play develops, you have to know which line is threatened. Is that sideline threatened? Then you're going to pivot and look back down towards the goal line at your, at your wing official. You've got to read that receiver. If he's coming where the back, where the in line is threatened, then you're going to pivot and, and, and look down the line to your back judge. So you have to be able to do that and feel that, and it just takes a lot of different plays for you to feel that and make that pivot at the right time. So my uh, suggestion to you guys, and when you get to the goal line, uh, start at the media line. That's that dotted line behind the white, the next dotted line. Start there. That way you're not backing up, you're not moving. Uh, you don't have to worry about your headlines coming up and running into you, running past you. If he does run over in front of you, just tap him on his shoulder. But the next time I say, hey, we both here working. I need you to do your job, and I'm going to do my job. But start at the media line. Get that G. I, I take the G, and I put it up in the stands because the G is not for us. It's for the people in the stand, but trust me, they all know where the goal line is because they're going to jump up when they got to go across it. So it's not for us. 
Start there that way you can stay still, you can officiate, and you don't have to worry about moving. Because it, like Terrell says, if you're moving, you're not officiating. That's called uh, self-preservation. Uh, before we close, guys, a couple things um, that we will make sure, I want to make sure that we continue to ingrain in yourself. Verbal communication with your short flank is, is really key to being a real good deep, deep official. Um, I, I make it a, a point to try to verbally communicate with my short flank at least once a series. Um, and it, it's something quick, and but I'm calling them by name. So if it's, you know, hey, John, second down. I got second down. And I want him to reply back with second down or at least give me, uh, if he can't verbally do it, as long as I can visually see that he gives me second down, uh, that helps tremendously. And I purposely call by name. That makes sure that he stays in the game and so do you. Uh, once you do that, because we – we're back there for, you know, 148 plays, and once that on play 149 is when that long bomb comes to us. And if we're asleep at the wheel, uh, that's when the wrecks happen. That's when the, well, the train accidents happen. So we got to make sure that we, we stay alert, we stay, stay in that. And so I verbally try to make a, a point to just communicate with my short plank. And it, it's nothing major. Uh, Definitely during timeouts, you want to make sure you communicate that, and they'll appreciate it just as much. They got a lot of things going on there. You don't want to mess up your pre-snap routine. Uh, you want to be able to continue to get into it, but if you're able to do that, I think it's actually huge, uh, and it'll make for a better sideline, especially as you communicate and you go back and forth from one side to the other. That allows you guys to build a relationship, to build a uh, um, that, that communication level to where you are able to speak to one another and you know what's going on. And a good short flank will do the exact same thing to you. And, you know, he'll, hey, Brandon, I got second down as I'm looking at my down indicator, and I had actually moved mine to third, totally forgot we had a foul on the previous play, and that just, I got third, oh, no, I got second down because of that. You know, and that's just a way to continue to keep yourself into it. Um, Y'all know the stigma. All we do is watch one player. You know, I, I correct I correct people in a hurry. I tell them we don't watch one, we watch two. Um, but obviously, we know we watch a lot more than that. So I, I jokingly say that because even though we are back there, uh, I gotta watch the we gotta watch the receiver and the and and the, the defensive back. But a good deep flank will actually take on you know those additional keys that we talked about. So just remember that you're doing. Remember, continue to do those things. Dead ball officiating as a as a as a deep flank or as a deep official, not even just a deep flank, but definitely a deep official, this will propel your career in ways that you will never imagine. And, I, and regardless if your goal, whatever your goals are, if you want to be the best deep official in DFOA, dead ball officiating, watch where it gets you. You want to be the best at whatever level you are, dead ball officiating, watch where it gets you. We have the best view in the house next to the people in the, in the press box. We're 20, 25 yards away. We get to see all the action um, by, all, uh, by team A and team B. We get to see it. So we should, and depending on the game, and it's not that you're going to look for it, but we should probably have the most dead ball uh, fouls uh, by position, only because of where we are on the field, uh, those things are able to, to come into our line of sight a lot easier. And on that note, Brandon, as a deep official, you don't need to watch the ball carrier that just got tackled. You got guys right there getting the ball from that guy. You've got guys getting the, the defenders off of that guy. It's the other guys that's around, that's standing around, that's, that's, that's got some cheap shots going here and there. So if you're ball watching and you're watching the guy lying on the ground with the ball, then you're not really dead ball officiating. You're, you're acting as if you're a spectator saying, ooh, he got hit hard, he's laying on the ground. But you've got to watch these other guys that are up and around. And, and from, that, from that view, as a deep official, you'll be able to see it all. And, again, if you're watching the game, popcorn, I suggest you quit, buy you a ticket, and get you some popcorn. They got to have popcorn, right? They got to have popcorn. popcorn. A, good, a, a, good, a good DFOA game, you got to have some popcorn. You, y'all know how it is. So, um, preventive officiating, guys, as, as, a, as a deep official, as is any, any position on the field, um, I make it a point, that at our level it's a little easier because we have the media guides and all that kind of crap, 
but no excuse. It doesn't matter. And when I in DFOA during pregame, I'm going out to I'll ask the coach, hey, who's your starters? Right? I want to know who my starting receivers are and I want to know who my starting DBs are for both teams. And I write them down. I write them down for team A and for team B, for Garland and for Allen or whoever it is. I'm writing them down. And as I'm doing that, I want to get those players' names. So if we get into a tight game, I'm immediately, hey, Jason, cut that out. Call him by his name, right? You know, uh, you know, hey, Todd, I saw that. You do that. He's going to turn like, wait a minute, how do you know my name? Well, for one, I've already got it because of the coach. And we've built, now we've built that rapport that allows them to kind of slow down any type of action uh, that they may have done and also prevents any type of a second action. That's why I consider that preventive officiating. If it's possible and you got two players that are getting into it or you got two players that you can see that, that temperature is rising a little bit, try to get to both players at the same time. Um, and I mean just get in between, get to both of them. Hey, Jason, hey, hey Todd, hey, hey, 25, hey, 11, if you don't know their names, hey, guys, I'm back here. I see it. I'm watching it. Cut it out. Uh, none of the extracurricular stuff. We're here to play football. Um, the, you know, just make sure that they both know that you're there. And if it gets to the point that you have to, engage the captains. Bring the captains in. You should have that down on your, uh, on your game card. Those, their peers are going to be the ones that get to them the most. I, I got a 17-year-old kid, and I don't know half of what he texted me now because I don't understand their lingo anymore. So, but another 17-year-old kid can, can tell him to do the same thing that I said. That makes more sense to him. So if you get that opportunity, get one of his captains. Hey, man, get 24 over here, man. Talk, he's killing me. He's over, he just won't stop. Once you do that and, and that captain gets him, you know, they'll, they can hit him across the head and across the helmet and, and pop their shoulder pads and kind of shake him up and, and wake him up. And that, that helps uh, and allows them to, to, to self um, – to, uh, take care of themselves themselves without you getting involved. And if worst case you got to, you know, obviously you can involve a coach, uh, but that would be the last method. If you've tried all the other methods, then I think that would be something you would have to definitely bring into uh, bring into play. And let your strike speak, man. I mean, if you a lot of times you can just come in, hey, guys, I'm here, hey, guys, I'm here. Just you saying that alone, those two players will separate uh, from themselves. Uh, we talked about ball mechanics, and we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, but the biggest thing about the ball mechanics is you can see what's on the slide up there. Let those colors separate. Once red and blue separate, then I'm looking for a ball, and not one second before then. Um, I want to make sure that blue is going back to, to their bench and red is going back to, to their bench or to their huddles, whatever it may be want to make sure that they are going to their, uh, their specific area. So if you do that, then you get a ball and you kind of get it in. And we talked about the substitution, so I won't, you know, read that again. But uh, lastly, don't dwell on the past play or the past plays. If you think you may have missed something, as a deep official, it's so hard because we're not engaged on every single play all the time. If it's a – if it's – three yards in a cloud of dust, and we're back there backpedaling and coming forward, backpedaling and coming forward, it's real easy to get complacent and to not stay alert. Um, but that time that you need to stay alert, you want to make sure that you do that. And in doing that, um, that keeps you in the game. So if you miss that play, don't dwell on it. Uh, we want to make sure that you are able to, to be there. So, uh, guys, we only got about four or five minutes. Uh, I, don't, I know a lot of the Q&A um, – Bruce uh, has been taken care of, but we definitely want to open it up if there are any questions from the um, from the uh, from the panel or from anybody else that's out there. I, Brandon, I, I did see a couple of questions when we were talking goal line. Okay. So so someone asked when when does the field judge and side judge go to the goal line and the back judge go to the end line? So that's a very good question. So so go ahead. So uh, once the ball gets to B twenty five then the field judge and the side judge go to the goal line. Back judge, go to the end line at that point. It ain't no use you standing in the middle of the end zone because if a ball comes, if they throw a ball in the middle of the end zone, again, you moving and you're not officiating. So once the ball gets to the B25, that's the 25-yard line going in, then you move to the goal line. Side judge, field judge, you're on the goal line. Back judge, you're on the end line. So, and on that note, 
Another question that followed up from that, once the field judge and side judge are on the goal line, and let's say a play is taking them deeper into the end zone and they're starting out on the goal line, do they stay on the goal line or do they kind of migrate and move? What's your philosophy on that? You want to explain that to us? So them? every official know you can read and tell whether or not a ball is going into the end zone or not. Deep. We're talking about deep. If, if deep, deep. Deep into the end zone. If you're on the goal line, so the you, play's taking them to the end line. So all you do is you move from the goal line and you walk a couple of steps. So all you're trying to do is get an angle to see whether or not he gets both feet down if he possesses one the ball. Oh, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. one foot down, possess the ball, everything. Because remember, in any situation, distance is your friend. So if you start running up and you get too close to a receiver in the DB, you're going to miss something. So all you do is you just walk down or you walk out so you can get a better angle and you get in a position where you can see the possession, feet, a foot down, whether or not he maintains possession. I, I, don't, I don't run that. I think at the most I probably go half, halfway up the end zone possibly. But I would get where I can see that action by those two players. Uh, any other questions from the uh, chat? Thank you, guys. Any other questions? Uh, Bruce, if you guys can open up or if, they, if we have any, a couple more in the chat. I know we're almost up, uh, up against it, so I want to make sure we're able to answer any other questions that may be out there. I don't see any other questions being posed, uh, Brandon. Yeah, Very good. I think everything pretty good, Brandon. All right, guys. Uh, All right, David. Dave, I forgot about you. Yeah, hey, David, there you go. Okay, no problem. No problem. Hey, guys, I want to thank you guys for putting this great presentation together, man. I know that it takes a lot of time, and I want to also mention that. I know that, you know, we get together on Mondays, and everybody who joins in, they just see the presentation. But I don't think that everybody really appreciates how much time and hours out of your day this takes during the week just leading up to our presentation on Monday, guys. We have, we have virtual meetings with all the guys, you know, one or two times a week just to make sure everything goes smoothly. You know, nobody gets paid here, guys. We do this all for free, you know, and for the purpose of getting officials better. You know, that's my job, and I've been taking it seriously, and all these guys that have been helping me have been taking it seriously as well. So I really, really, really want to thank everybody. This is our third session, and we've covered all the positions uh, up to date to a certain point. So I think anybody that's joined in and listened has got a lot out of it. So I really, really, really appreciate everybody joining in and everybody that's been helping me make this possible for the chapter um, guys next week uh, we will have on May 11th we will ro- uh, rotate back to the referees and umpires it won't be the same uh, um, information it will just pick off where we left off all right so guys once again thank you very much uh, Bruce thanks for monitoring the chat um, Scott thanks for your help uh, Brandon Anthony Howard and Terrell thanks a lot guys we really appreciate it and I hope to see everybody back Monday night where we will continue off, right? Thanks a lot, guys. I feel better. You look good. Thank you. I just feel better. Everyone else has left the call.